Hello, so I'm Jakob, and I want to talk to you today. Thanks for coming, first of all, but I want to talk to you today about quality assurance in deep learning data sets. And I'm a senior AI researcher at Collabora. Um, let me say a few words about the, these guys because they sponsored this work, so <laughs> I like them. Uh, so we are doing, um, we are a consultancy, we provide full integrated open source solutions for you know, products, for whatever you may be building. Uh, we cover multiple domains from multimedia to bootloaders, uh, the kernel, augmented reality as well. We lead the Modado project. We are, so yeah, we lead the development of several important technologies and we can also help you get your charges merges, up, changes merged upstream so you don't have to keep spending resources on your vendor branches forever. So that's what we do. We also have an, uh, an AI team. It's small but you know, good. <laughs> and uh, we encountered this problem that labeling is like a very difficult task and um, it for sure requires a quality assurance process. Like you cannot just label data and assume it's going to be okay. And um, contrary to a lot of research you can find, um, not all errors average out and can be ignored. Like if you have errors in your data that are systematic, these biases will transfer to your model and it will make the same errors that were in your data set. So there is a lot of research on like random errors in deep learning networks and if you have, like if you train for long enough, all the random errors will average out and the model will be perfect. But if your errors are systematic, this is not the case. Um, and we think that the problem um, is really, people are doing QA, but the tooling for this is not amazing. So we looked into a couple of solutions uh, for labeling and asked, like, you know, we looked into open source solutions, checked them ourselves. We called a few companies that do uh, labeling tools. And most of them have only minimal support for review. And uh, what this means is that the QA process is actually more difficult and expensive than the, like, the labeling process. So there's an example, a quote from a keymaker. They are like a leading annotation services provider. I, I, they got recommended to me by, by you know, my friends. And they were very happy with them, but they say that annotations are reviewed four times in order to confirm accuracy. So two annotators label a given, obj label a given object, and then their supervisor checks the quality of, like checks both these annotations and makes the decision if they are good or not. That's a lot of work. And, uh, So uh, here's an example uh, from a high quality data set. And can you spot the mistake? Not really. Okay, let's make it a little bit bigger. Is it, is it easier to spot the mistake now? <laughs> Imagine you have to do this for tens of thousands of photos. And uh, that's not really you know, an easy way to do it. Uh, the question is, can we do better? And uh, there are a couple of ways you can approach this problem. So uh, a lot of methods I've seen um, are using, you know, really clever statistical techniques to reveal the errors. So you train some model, you look at the outputs, you try to figure out which are, of them are unlikely to be correct. And uh, this works, but we found that there is a surprisingly easy way that is completely complementary to these methods that makes it a lot easier to do the quality assurance process. So, Technically, this image has all the information you need to find the error, but it's still pretty hard. And our key insight is to transfer this problem by bringing similar things together. It makes it easier to spot the error. So now, it's pretty easy to see that among these uh, you know, 60 uh, speed limit signs, there's one that says 30. And yeah, this error is much easier to spot now. So if we go back, you can actually see that the label on the 30 speed limit sign was said limit 60, right? But how would you spot that? You would have to spend like an extraordinary amount of time on that. So the key insight is that if you show similar images together, the, the, whatever you want to do with the data is like so much easier. And it's reducing the cognitive load because you can focus on one thing at a time and you know, all, like get, uh, see similar things and, and focus on one, one task and not like all the 400 categories you have and you know, on every photo. It helps you highlight the like, real-world variety of the samples, so you can actually see a big sample of your data set on a, of a particular class, for example, and see like, 
how are they different? Like what different you know, subclusters you could take out? Like what is actually what you're looking for, right? In, in, in the case of traffic science, it may be trivial. It's not, but like, there are much more difficult examples when it's actually kind of difficult to figure out what really the label means, right? Especially if you're you know, not deeply familiar with the data yet. And um, one interesting thing is that you can actually do this if you have the labels. So if you have the label data set and you have the, you know, the bounding boxes, for example, you can crop them and do it. You can also do it using AI for unlabeled data, which will, I will get back to in a moment. Like on the right, you can see the example of Deep Fashion 2, a data set, and it's sorted by visual similarity by our algorithm. So another example, uh, these are random images from ImageNet of ambulances. This is the ambulance class. And you can see that we get all different kinds of images. Like we got, we got an image of an inside of the ambulance. We got people inside an ambulance. We got ambulances from the outside. We got a military ambulance or whatever that is. And if we sort them out, it's actually much easier to focus, right? Because you got similar poses and similar um, things shown together, and it's much easier to review them and see if they are correct or not. I believe there are no errors in the ambulances in ImageNet. But I may be wrong, but I, I spent quite a bit of time and tried to find errors. There are no errors on the ambulances. They were, there was an error in uh, Red Wolves. They, somehow a lion got there. Like baby lion got into the Red Wolves. But let's go back to traffic science, because that's uh, also an interesting case study. So we looked at the Mapillary Traffic Sign dataset, which is a high-quality dataset released by uh, Mapillary, which they are currently a subsidiary of Meta. So, you know, it's a high-quality dataset. They have a lot of resources to do it good. And if you read the paper, they actually did a lot of work to, to actually make the dataset good. And we estimated the error rate. Like, we took a few easy classes, like the speed limits, and the error rate is at least 1%. So like, I didn't review all of them yet, but it's at least 1% from the like, free classes I, I checked uh, you know, very deeply. Uh, so it may be a lot, maybe not, but we'll, we'll get back to it in a moment. So here you can see the 80s uh, speed limit. <laughs> and yeah, one stands out, it's actually a 90. Uh, same here, thing. so another part of the 80 uh, speed limits, there's a 4.0 speed limit. I don't know what this means. Um, Here's another interesting one. So these are, there are actually two arrows here. Um, so you can see that these things happen in, in the real world, even with you know, a lot of careful, uh, careful work to avoid mistakes. It just, it just happens. And uh, we also did another thing, uh, because if you look at the, mm, the data set in the paper, uh, they have this thing called other sign which should be mostly about like, uh, information science on a highway, like which way you should go and things like that. They, they don't have a, a strict like, label, right? There's no label that says, OK, this is, to, this is the way to Austin. <laughs> there will be too many labels. So they have this class that calls, says other sign. It's actually the most uh, common class in the data set. It's like 90% of all the traffic signs are actually other signs. And we took all these ground, crew, drown, ground truth crops from the Mapillary data set. We trained a simple classifier. Then um, we selected 700 things that were supposed to be other signs, but our model actually believed that they are regulatory no-entry signs. And among these 700 images, there were actually 170 other, like there were 170 no-entry signs that were actually mislabeled. So this 1% you know, error uh, estimation is actually quite low. And this is going to confuse the model, right? Because if you have like, so many examples and it's such a big, uh, you know, numerous class, the model doesn't know what to do. Should it predict other sign or should it predict uh, regulatory no entry, right? And it will make mistakes you know, statistically uh, according to this. So um, this, yeah, I think it confirms that this is a sheer, serious issue. And even if uh, you know, a lot of resources put into getting a high quality data set, it still may, you know, it may turn out that you actually have errors there. Uh, we did another uh, case study. This is a little bit funny. Uh, we created a data set of men and women and t-shirts of various colors using image search. So we went to Bing image search and we typed in like a woman in a black t-shirt, for example. And we got 20 classes, 10 colors, you know, men and women. 
20,000 uh, 20, images, um, and an 80% error rate. <laughs> like, actually, there are, okay, what, what does it mean that there's an error rate? Like, what, okay, so, you know, it, there are some difficult cases, like if this is really a t-shirt or not. Okay, so some of them are actually difficult, and you can learn, like, if you look at the samples, if you, like, drill down, you can actually learn a lot more about your data than you would imagine. I didn't expect, you know, there's so much variation in t-shirts. But there's also like stuff where there's a t-shirt, there's no per per person in the photo, right? And I explicitly ask for a person in a t-shirt, not a t-shirt on a hanger. You get like some other pieces of clothing, you get uh, dresses, whatever, right? So we get a lot of errors. And if you do it, like we did a lot of splits and 80% is a pretty accurate error estimation. Uh, why is this important? Uh, because it may seem like a trivial, uh, trivial you know, uh, thing to do to get to image search, but in fact, a lot of people are excited about DALI, and DALI is this image generation model. And they, it is actually trained on image search, right? Like, they scrape the internet, they take text and the images around it, and they build this, like, enormous data sets. And, you know, it's not like they're not trying, but, yeah, um, you get 80% error rate, so the model has to how somehow figure it out, and I doubt it is not affecting the, 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 uh, you know, the quality of the results. So I'm pretty sure we're not going to fix uh, you know, billions of images using MLFX, but yeah, that's, that's, that, 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 these are important problems. So let me just do a quick demo and show you what, what does it actually look like to use the, the tool if we, we, we came up with. So. Here's an example. This is like the deep fashion data set. Uh, do I have a car? So, okay. ML fixes the name of your tool? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, sorry, I didn't say that. Yeah, sure, thanks. Uh, so, you know, I don't have a product to sell you. There's no, like, you know, enterprise subscription for ML fix. It's just an open source project that we, you know, I thought that would be useful. So, uh, so here are some examples. Like, there's a lot of variety in this, right? This is the full data, uh, deep fashion data set without anything. So we can actually, but you can see how the interface works, but we can actually switch to our sorting method. And now you can see that we actually get a lot of very similar images. And if you, for example, wanted to you know, exclude images that have you know, pieces of paper in the background, you can just drag and do it quite quickly. Okay, I have difficulty seeing this, but you get the idea, right? And uh, oh, here's another one. But if you look at a lot of photos that are visually similar, I don't know. I just did a lot of experiments, and I find it much easier if I have like a lot of similar photos to make a decision. And if I get, you know, everything is completely random, and I get a new, completely different photo every time, I just have trouble memorizing like the five or six rules I want to apply to this to decide whether it is good or not. So it's like it's really actually a difficult cognitive problem, I think. Or maybe I'm just stupid, but. Um, Okay, then uh, right now you can download a JSON file and get a JSON file with all the markings you did. That's, yeah, we're go going to go back to that. So that's the idea. That's how you could quickly scan through like a lot of images and try to remove the ones that have errors in them. Uh, I know this looks pretty simple, but we really tried to search and we didn't find any other tools that do this. Maybe you will uh, you know, tell me that they are there, but at least, I'm pretty sure there are no open source ones. Uh, okay, sorry. No. So let me like, spend a few minutes to tell you how this works. So you can imagine how the, how the interface works. It's a browser interface. And uh, browsers are really good at showing people images. So <laughs> they're a good <laughs> platform to develop such a tool. But uh, on the back end, we actually do a little bit of deep learning to, to do the sorting. And I think it's kind of interesting. So, we start by pre-training uh, a ResNet-18 model with Barlow twins. There's actually a paper from Google that says that the, the, the stupider your model, the better for <laughs> visual similarity. So they actually recommend the ResNet-6, but I would have to implement that from scratch, so I, I stuck with the ResNet-18. It trains very quickly because we don't want to train it for a long time because it, it, it starts to get worse. Barlow twins is the, I don't know if you're familiar with that, this is like a contrastive learning. Uh, so we take, a, like we take a batch of images, like 16 or 32 images, we augment them and distort them, every one of them, in two different ways. And then we basically uh, train the model to predict correlated, uh, to, to output correlated features for 
the same image that was distorted in two different ways in contrast to the, all the other images in the batch that are not uh, of the same kind. So it's basically one against every, everybody else. And it works quite well. Uh, there are you know, multiple methods that does this. Parallel Twins is nice because it's very simple. But there are other methods that on, based on the similar idea, and you could, you could, you could use either of them. The, the nice thing about this is it's completely unsupervised. You don't need any labels. You can just apply it on any photos you have. Um, then we take the feature vectors, but not the ultimate ones. So um, normally a ResNet outputs like a single vector of like 256 numbers or 512 floating point numbers. That doesn't work that well, we, we, we figured. Like we tried this and not amazing. So we actually go back a little bit and take the second to last layer, which in case of 224 by 224 images, gives you a 14 by 14 grid of vectors. Each one contains 20, 256 floating point numbers. And then uh, we actually do a clustering. So we take k-means, which is like a standard unsupervised clustering algorithm, and we ask it to like, you know, make only uh, 1,024 classes. So each of these you know, long feature vectors get compressed to a single number that says, okay, this is class. Uh, this is the cluster no number you know, 500. And you can see on the right that it actually works quite well. Uh, the T-shirt, for example, is a single uh, cluster. The colors, each color represents a different cluster. So like the hands are clustered together, the, both the right and the left hand, the, the, the arms, sorry. The hands as well, the jeans, the face is something that's also similar to the model, for the model. So this works quite well. You get some strange artifacts here, um, if you're interested. Yeah, I actually dig into it a little bit. It looks like ResNet is not really, like it has edge artifacts. So the, the, the features you get on the edges of the image are much different from what you get in the middle. I have uh, a notebook that uh, lets you explore that, but that's not the topic here. And then we take these, we call them visual worlds because yeah, that's what the literature called them. This is like a technique borrowed from the pre-deep learning uh, days. And we take these visual words, and if an image contains at least one example of a visual word, we will set one in a you know, 224-bit vector. So uh, this is basically what's called bag of words, bag of visual words. Uh, it's a little bit different because we only set the values to zero or one because uh, in these deep learning techniques, you get a fixed uh, amount of features. For every image, I get exactly 196 features. So if there are lots, there's a lot of background, I don't want to you know, uh, have you know, 20 in, the, in a single position because all the, all the, like, uh, there was a lot of background. This actually makes it worse. So we came up with this idea to just uh, have a binary, whether the feature was in the image or not, not how many uh, activations it got. And then uh, we do a very simple thing. We start with some random image, and then we find the next one that has the highest count of common visual words. So yeah, we do an element-wise multiplication and a sum to calculate like if there's a one in, a, in the bag of words vector for the first image and the one in the bag of words vector in the same position on the second image, we get a one in the result, and we sum them up. And as you can see, uh, this is uh, an example from the, from the t-shirt data set. Like, we get really good results. Like, no, this lady here uh, in the green uh, shirt, actually, like, we grouped all of these together. And also, like, the last two t-shirts are pretty similar, and the same on the bottom row. Like, you can see the visual similarity between, the, between these examples, right? So it works quite well. Um, it has some limitations. Um, so the biggest one is that the model, it's completely unsupervised, so we didn't provide any uh, annotations, any labels. So we, it doesn't really know what we care about, right? So it has no idea. And it, sometimes it happens that actually, it, like, not sometimes, all of the times it happens that it doesn't know where, what is the foreground and what is the background object in the scene. Like there are techniques to do it, but they mostly do it on video because then you can kind of guess like what the camera is following, right? There was a very interesting paper from Facebook about it. But if you have random like images, still images, it's kind of difficult to do it without a supervision. So we could train a segmentation network, but then it would be specific to a particular data set, and uh, we wanted to keep it unsupervised. So, but that's a limitation. And you can see on the right here that, for example, the gray uh, boxes represent uh, the, feet, like, the uh, patches of the image 
that are uh, matched between the top and the bottom image, right? So the top and the bottom image are very similar, but as you can see, a lot of the similarity for the model is actually because of the background, not because of the foreground. So yeah, it's a kind of a balance, and it's, I, I don't have an idea how to fix it automatically, but it still works pretty well, but yeah, you have to be aware of that, that it, sometimes it may be the background. It's still useful, even if it's the background, because it still helps, and it's, you know, but that's a limitation. Um, so this is, an, uh, uh, you know, a, an investigation, an open source project to try to fix it, and uh, as I said, we don't have a, a, an enterprise plan to sell it, it's not a product. But we really would like to make it easier to, to use it. Uh, so I would you know, welcome any feedback you may got and any problems you may have with data quality. That maybe we could, we could try to help you and make this product more useful, project more useful. Uh, we want to do it basically like right now it's a separate tool. You have to you know, prepare JSON files and stuff. And we want to actually integrate it so you can run it straight from your Jupyter notebooks. And it would be amazing if you could do it back and forth. So after you, you know, attach labels to the images, so you say which one are okay or not, or maybe you have some different kind of uh, classification you want to apply, uh, you could easily get these results back and still uh, slice them you know, further in, in Jupyter and, or in Python. So that's one thing we want to do. Another thing is that, as I said, we are not the only guys interested in this problem. So um, there are some, you could call them sorting techniques invented by other people. So for example, one is uh, CleanLab, that's like a research product, and recently they, I think, started a company around it. They uh, use trained models to try to predict if there's an error or not in the data set. That looks really, really interesting. But they didn't catch the lion among the red wolves, I checked. Um, there's also like the technique, I've seen it popularized by the FastAI community. They do a classif classification model and they check which examples during training have the highest loss. So the model has a hard time learning this, so maybe it's actually a mistake in the labeling, right? Uh, this works, I've seen it work, but on the other hand, I tried it on the, on the image search data sets and if there are too many errors, then it's no longer a good signal. So uh, I didn't like, yeah, but it's also useful. And one thing, uh, last thing is, uh, what I did for the uh, traffic signs, so you can like check your confusion metrics and see like which classes are confused, and these are great like you know uh, things to check if, if if there maybe there are errors. So like there are similar methods but kind of different. We, we, it would be great if you could like use it without too much trouble. You didn't have to write it from your or from scratch. There's also like an interesting uh, thing. Um, I, I had to share this. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, there are deep learning clustering methods, and one of them is actually uh, used in the DALI technique I mentioned before. This is like vector quantized variational autoencoders. That's a long name. Uh, but the idea is that you can, uh, apparently you can teach a model to um, like learn the features and cluster them at the same time in a single end-to-end -end process. And it basically means that you learn a codebook. So that's basically the same thing as k-means. Uh, on conceptually, the code book, you just find the nearest neighbor exactly as k means. But the whole thing is you know, implemented cleverly enough that you can train it end to end using uh, grad gradient descent. And uh, they show pretty good results. Like you've seen DALI, right? The, the, the image generation. Uh, yeah, it looks like it really can capture the semantic information from the photo. So we would love to, train, to try that. And I think it should be able to, like, we should be able to, to implement it in the method. So in summary, uh, the QA task, uh, I think it's very different and requires a new user interface, different than the labeling user interface. Um, one thing I noticed is that it's, it's good to improve both the UIs and the AIs of the system you're building. So if you just focus on the AI, you will not get optimal results. Because every time you have a new, uh, every time you have a new uh, AI system, you have like a new frontier that you can make, actually make a better user interface to make use of it, right? And uh, one uh, last thing is that you could actually use deep learning, in this case unsupervised deep learning, to augment what people are already doing. Like you don't need to focus on replacing people, you can focus on uh, helping them do a better job. And as you could see, it's actually possible to do it and you can improve like the lives of the people who are using your tools quite substantially. Um, the image on the right uh, uh, is actually created by, by a 
AI model. It's called Centipede Diffusion. I asked it for a robot cleaning the streets of New York, which are overflowing with papers. Yeah, that's what came to my mind, and this is like a mascot of the project. Um, I did a little bit of tweaking here and there, but that's a topic for another talk, uh, maybe someday. Um, you, could, you can download this code that I used to, 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 to present these examples from our GitHub uh, repository. As I said, this is not a product. This is more like an invitation to disc for discussion, so I'd love to learn uh, like what kind of problems do you have with you know, quality in your deep, uh, deep learning data sets, and you know, maybe we can figure out how to make it uh, useful and more useful for you know, your particular pro problems. So we created a Gitter community, so you can have a chat. We will be there and you know, ask any, uh, like if you have any questions, we'll really try to help you. We have resources dedicated to that. And uh, so, as I said, I'm from Collabora. Um, I encountered this problem on a few projects I did, uh, both before joining Collabora and afterwards. And they were actually so amazing to let me just work on it. They said, okay, that's interesting. Please do, like, like work for it for a couple of months. So, I, yeah, I highly recommend them, and uh, thank you for your attention. Okay, uh, so the question is if this was built on TensorFlow. Actually, this is built on PyTorch and uh, with the FastAI library. I just find it, for me, it's, it was easier to use. But the techniques are, of course, applicable outside of this domain, right? Like you can use any framework to do this. So I tried a couple of things. Uh, so the question is, how many, how many hidden layers do I have, or like, what's the optimal model, I guess, for this kind of problem? So I tried a couple of things. And actually, the simpler the model, and this is confirmed, actually, like independently was confirmed. Like, you know, I came up with this conclusion and uh, that it was confirmed in a paper from, I think, Google Brain. There is a paper about uh, perceptual similarity. And they found out that the, the smaller the model and the shorter the training time, the better it is at figuring out perceptually similar things. And they made a proper research about it and you know, created the data set and everything. So it seems like, and that's good because you can train these models very, very quickly. You don't, have, you, you don't need a lot of resources. But um, yeah, so it's, it's, uh, it's actually a very simple model. And, uh, but it does work on all kinds of data, and uh, you know it doesn't work on everything as, as, as well. But you can train it on a completely different data than, than ImageNet, for example. So, um, and it still works, right? Because you, this is fully unsupervised, so you can train it on you know, any data, image data you have. I didn't thought about how you could apply this to NLP. And, uh, and, it, and it works. It should work still. Okay, so uh, if there are any questions, then thank you very much, and uh, I hope I'll hear from you soon about your problems with data and how we could actually try to build an open source solution to help. Thank you very much. <laughs>